Okay, great. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it is such a pleasure to see so many familiar faces. Uh, we kind of feel like the Grateful Dead. You know, wherever we go, some of the audience follow us, so that's fantastic. We have a star-studded panel here. Welcome to this timely session on FinTech, a game changer for financial inclusion and gender equality, especially coming after yesterday's G20 supported Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion Conference here in Washington, D.C. My name is Babak Abbasadeh. I'm the CEO of Toronto Center and your MC. Toronto Center was established in 1998 to promote sound financial governance, financial stability, and financial inclusion. We do this by building the capacity of financial sector supervisors and regulators in emerging market countries and developing countries. So I want to also at this point acknowledge a couple of our board members who are here. So John Palmer, our chair. John, could you please raise your hand? And Andrea Corcoran, um, a former chair of our Securities Advisory Board. Chela pazar from the World Bank. Also, Stefan Ingves is represented here by Cecilia and uh, Aditya Narain of IMF by Martin. Am I, I hope I'm not missing any of our board members, but I just wanted to make sure that you recognize them. Without their dedication, this place could not function. Toronto Center could not do what it does. The challenge before us is more than one billion women in developing countries don't have access to formal financial services. Toronto Centre believes that inclusive financial systems are a powerful instrument for women's empowerment and poverty reduction. Women's ability to save, borrow, control their own money, and to insure themselves and their assets reduces poverty and promotes better health and nutrition outcomes for their families. It also enables women to contribute to increase national economic activity and growth. Fintech innovations such as digital finance show great promise in expanding financial services to the previously excluded, especially to poor and rural women. These developments are consistent with and help underpin the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, especially SDG 5 on empowerment of women and girls, that is above action agenda, as well as Canada's new feminist international assistance policy. However, the promise FinTech holds for advancing financial inclusion and gender equality will not happen by itself. While financial inclusion can promote greater access to credit in the absence of adequate regulation and supervision, imprudent credit expansion may pose risks to financial stability. To mitigate the potential risk of expanding access to financial services, it is critical to promote well-governed financial systems and effective regulatory and supervisory frameworks. Financial supervisors and regulators must work collaboratively with multi-stakeholders within the development ecosystem to design and promote appropriate and proportionate oversight that strikes a balance between mitigating risks to financial stability while promoting innovation and protecting consumers. Today, our distinguished speakers will share their perspectives on this and other relevant complex issues. Toronto Centre's work is generously supported by our key funders, Global Affairs Canada, since 1998, Swedish CEDA, or the only CEDA standing, and the IMF. We also remain indebted to one of our original founders, the World Bank Group. We also thank the Civil Society Forum for supporting this event. So at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, our opening speaker. You all have the bios of everyone here, so my intention is not to read the bios but to just give a couple of pointers. Uh, Minister Bibeau was elected to Parliament in October uh, 2015, and soon after that was appointed by uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. You might have heard of him. And, and uh, she is in charge for, of the portfolio of international development and la francophonie. And uh, she fulfills, fulfills her duties uh, uh, with impeccable work ethics. She was also a very successful businesswoman, and at some point in her career, she did work with Canadian CEDA with postings in Morocco and Benin. But well, what I remember most distinctly about the minister is I met her at a consultation forum in Montreal, it was in 2016, I believe it was around August. And what impressed me is she started her comments by saying, I only have three priorities, women and girls, girls and women, and women and girls. So I think we heard the message loud and clear, and she has, uh, shown a lot of leadership in this area, especially in introducing and launching a very unique Canada's international feminist assistance policy, which the words itself describes what the policy is about. So at this point, I would like to um, 
welcome Minister to the podium to uh, deliver her opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Babak. <clears throat> it's, it's really a pleasure for me to be with you today and to have the the honor to give the opening remarks to this uh, conference. Um, today's discussion is a timely one and resonates well with Canada's new feminist international assistance policy that I'm so proud of. Specifically, whether fintech can help empower women, lead to gender equality, and then contribute to end poverty around the world. There's no doubt about the benefits for everyone in particular, women, of having access to reliable, safe, and cost-effective financial services. And that fintech is having a transformative effect. But it won't be a game changer if we don't also work in parallel to ensure that women have an, have an identity, that they are financially literate, and that they have control over their bodies. Let me start with identity. As we speak, 1.1 billion women remain locked out of the formal financial system because of the lack of documentation and other forms of identification to open a single savings account, let alone access, cre uh, access credit, financial, or other services to grow their businesses. But identity doesn't have to remain a barrier to financial inclusion. India has recently implemented an innovative biometric ID system that has dramatically expanded access to financial services. Following the launch of the People's Wealth Program and building on the mobile revolution, the government of India is now on track for all Indian women to be financially included in the organized banking system. Recognizing the necessity of, identi of identity to financial inclusion, Canada is working closely with the Center of Excellence for Civil Registration and Vital Statistics Systems. As part of our new feminist international assistance policy, we are also providing $150 million to a new initiative called women's voice and leadership. This program will support local women's organization in at least 30 countries to help advance the rights of women and girls. This is the foundation for enabling environment for financial inclusion that encompasses equitable access to property, financial services, markets, value chains, and technology. But with access, must come knowledge, which is my second point. Financial literacy rates among women must improve. Globally, it's only 30%. According to Standard & Poor's financial literacy survey, women are less likely to provide correct answers to financial literacy questions and are also more likely to indicate that they don't know the answer. To address this gap, Canada's new international assistance policy promotes financial, greater financial literacy for women by supporting training, encouraging greater entrepreneurship, and giving women the financial literacy they need to succeed. This summer, we announced a $20 million com dollars commitment to the World Bank's Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative, or WeFi. WeFi aims to mobilize more than a billion dollars in financing to unlock the potential of women entrepreneurs by addressing the persistent challenges they face, including financial literacy. <coughs> but even more fundamental to women's empowerment and gender equality is the right of women to have control over their own bodies. In far too many countries around the world, women are denied the, chain, the chance to seize economic opportunities because they are denied the right to choose whether, when, or with whom to have children. Canada firmly believes that 
a women's fundamental right to economic empowerment cannot be distinguished from her fundamental right to choose. Canada firmly believes that when sexual and reproductive health and rights are respected, other rights become more accessible. That is why we committed $650 million to help women and girls access the full range of sexual and reproductive health and rights services, as well as the information they need to thrive. Let me bring all these points together by touching on the relationship between fintech and financial inclusion. According to the global research from McKinsey, digital finance has the potential to provide access to financial services for 1.6 billion people in emerging economies, more than half of them women. Digital payments, especially, have a range of specific benefits for women, including privacy and control over their funds. They can have a better view into their own family, their family's income, and control their own earnings. Half a billion women world pay. Half a million women worldwide pay for utilities and cash, while a quarter of a billion women do the same for school fees. Significant time and resources could be saved through digital payments. The rapid spread of mobile phones is what makes this opportunity possible and developing countries are leaders in this area. L'argent mobile est maintenant disponible dans 85% des marchés où moins de 20% de la population possède un compte dans une institution financière formelle. L'Afrique possède plus de la moitié des 271 services d'argent mobile disponibles à travers le monde et le deux tiers des comptes mobiles actifs. And according to The Economist magazine, Kenya leads the world in mobile money, mobile money. So we know that fintech can be transformative, but without the foundations in place that I spoke about earlier, proper identification, financial literacy, and sexual and reproductive health and rights, fintech's potential benefits for gender equality and poverty reduction cannot be fully realized. But we can leapfrog in these areas too. That is why I'm pleased the Toronto Centre has brought this panel together today to discuss the opportunities and risk that FinTech presents. Unfortunately, I cannot stay for the whole panel, but uh, let me leave you with a few questions of my own. Can the rapid and broad proliferation of mobile money, mobile money be applied to the issue of identification, for instance, digital identities? What new learning applications are available to help boost the financial literacy rate for women? And how do we make these accessible? Finally, can mobile technology in the internet increase access to sexual and reproductive health and rights, particularly in remote or stigmatized populations, where the availability and reach of information and services can be limited or non-existent? And Further today, I will leave you my, with my excellent Deputy Minister and a very knowledgeable panel, and I look forward to hear afterwards uh, your conclusion, the conclusions of your discussions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much for those insightful comments, uh, Madam Minister, and some of your questions I'm sure will be addressed by the panel. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce a special speaker from the OECD. We're very um, happy that he's able to join us. Mr. Masamichi Kono uh, is the Deputy uh, Secretary General of the OECD, assumed this position in October, sorry, August of 2017. His, and listen to this part. He's responsible for strategic policy issues ranging from the environment, financial and enterprise affairs, anti-corruption, green growth, all the way to taxation. I'm just wondering what is really left. Uh, um, previously, Mr. Kono was the Vice Minister for International Affairs at the Japanese Financial Services Agency. He's had a long and distinguished career in financial supervision and regulation of financial services, both in Japan and in the international arena. 
including being the chair of the IOSCO, the International Standard Setter Body for Capital Markets Regulators, and also postings at the WTO. He was also chairman um, of the IR, I, IFRS Foundation Monitoring Board. And if that's not enough, he was also a scholar at uh, Hiroshima University and Columbia University. Please uh, join me in welcoming Mr. Khan. Mesdames et Messieurs, bonjour. Je suis très ravi d'être ici avec vous aujourd'hui. Et Madame la Ministre, merci beaucoup pour votre présence. Uh, maybe I should speak in English from now on. <laughs> uh, uh, on behalf of the uh, Secretary General of the OECD, uh, I would like to really congratulate the organizers and uh, all of you for having this uh, extremely important and timely discussion uh, about uh, how we can uh, reap the benefits of fintech for the uh, good of the people and particularly for women. And, um, um, well, I think it is needless to say for my part uh, um, why we have um, as an important uh, policy uh, uh, priority, uh, financial inclusion. And, um, well, of course, uh, you're all aware that this has been, uh, well, this has become an important policy goal, and uh, particularly to bring those that are excluded from the formal financial system to come into a well-run, well-regulated, uh, and well-functioning uh, financial system. And, um, this is, of course, for the uh, better lives of uh, everyone around the world. Um, well, in a way, we are fortunate that um, the uh, rapid introduction of technology uh, uh, is really taking down many of the barriers that prevented people from uh, accessing financial services, such as um, um, using appropriate financial products in the past. For example, um, uh, and this is actually what uh, Madame la Ministre already mentioned, that um, um, digital delivery certainly makes it possible for existing uh, providers to reduce costs and uh, turning previously unaccessible groups of uh, the population into a potential consumer base. It also encourages new entrants to uh, add to the services that are on offer, increasing competition, potentially creating products that are better tailored to the needs of the end user. Uh, and, for example, digital delivery uh, makes it uh, really feasible for new uh, providers to reach those who are geographically remote, including those living abroad. Um, and technology makes it feasible to provide the same service in several languages. Uh, it's something very important for someone like me coming from a uh, non-English, uh, non-French uh, native uh, country. And, um, and deliver via multiple platforms to um, reach vulnerable groups, including migrants and the disabled. Um, and so all this should be really good news for um, uh, gender equality. Uh, and uh, it is a fact, I must say, uh, unfortunately, that um, uh, women um, who still tend to be, uh, uh, tend to outnumber men among the financially and um, um, socially excluded, uh, uh, this is a, becoming a serious problem. And women still typically earn less than men, often make uh, responsibility, often take responsibility for responsibility for day-to-day -day money management, management, meaning that they need products that are low cost uh, and designed to offer small value frequent transactions. In many cultures, women also stay closer to home than men, so uh, they are less likely or able to visit a, uh, a village or town with a bank branch or uh, uh, have access to other financial services. So um, mobile banking, in a way, opens up this uh, uh, new world of opportunities to such women, prov providing uh, they can access a mobile phone. But um, the story doesn't stop here, and uh, we cannot just um, uh, rejoice at uh, this uh, new technology uh, improving the, uh, uh, the supply side uh, of uh, uh, finance. Uh, that is, uh, the benefits of uh, being able to the, uh, reap the benefits of such uh, um, new technologies, uh, fintech, uh, are uh, not at all for granted. And, um, Again, um, many surveys, including those undertaken by the OECD, have shown that women have um, uh, lower levels of financial knowledge than men on average. They also often appear to be less confident about their knowledge, uh, 
and uh, uh, without the relevant knowledge and skills, it is all too likely that they will make costly mistakes, such as underestimating the cost of credit or ignoring the impact of inflation when making savings decisions. So clearly, um, uh, supply side um, uh, advances um, must be uh, complemented by or should go in hand in hand with support for uh, such vulnerable, vulnerable consumers on the demand side. As recognized at the global level, including by G20 leaders, this includes appropriate regulation and consumer protection, uh, complemented by access to a high quality financial information, education, and guidance. Without this support, access to digital financial products may actually increase the vulnerability of uh, women. They may be insufficiently protected and could even fall foul to fraud and mis-selling in the new and unfamiliar digital environment. A new report developed by the OECD and presented to the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors in Washington, D.C. earlier this year highlights in more detail the demand-side challenges created by digital financial products. Uh, this report is called Ensuring Financial Education and Financial Consumer Protection for All in the Digital Age, including a wealth of information about the kinds of competencies that might be useful when using financial technology. It stresses the need to be able to identify and use trustworthy products and to conversely to uh, recognize and avoid products that may cause harm. It also notes that ideally financial education to help people to navigate digital financial products should start early, uh, targeting girls and boys in childhood. Efforts must also include awareness campaigns and initiatives that reach all segments of the population, including um, uh, those women who have been hitherto you know, excluded. Smart use of technology can support this process by facilitating digital uh, delivery of financial information and training that meets the needs of uh, consumers. To sum up, uh, FinTech looks set to remove many of the barriers that prevented women from becoming financial consumers and active entrepreneurs, whilst uh, also for offering the possibility to deliver financial education messages in a flexible manner. Uh, however, this is a vital role for, there is a vital role for governments, financial regulators and supervisors in promoting the development and safe use of beneficial products to ensure the economic em empowerment of women. So the OECD will continue to uh, support those efforts through the uh, G20 OECD Task Force on Financial Consumer Protection, uh, a network uh, in the name of FinconNet, and the OECD International Network on Financial Education, as well as participation in global fora such as uh, the Financial Stability Board, uh, etc. So thank you very much, and we look forward to a good discussion. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point um, in the program, I'd like to just let me tell you a little bit about how the session will flow, and then I will introduce the moderator. So when the moderator is here, they're gonna, she's going to start the session by basically following the Davos style of questions, asking questions of each of the panelists uh, so that we can get to the meat of the discussion, and then open it up for the uh, audience for you to ask your important questions. So at this point, I'd like to uh, introduce the, um, our senior moderator, uh, Diane Jacobella, who is the Deputy Minister of uh, International Development, a posting that she was appointed to in July of 2017. She served in the Canadian Public Service in very senior capacity since 1998 at Health Canada, the Privy Council Office, and which is the, really the Ministry of the Prime Minister and Human Resources Development Canada. She joined. Uh, the Canadian CEDA in 2016, uh, responsible for uh, the senior position for Eastern and, so and um, Southern Africa. And, uh, and also she was his Associate Deputy Minister for Foreign Affairs. She's played a key role in restructuring the Departments of Foreign Affairs, International Trade, and International Development over the course of the last few years. And she's really a recognized leader in the field of international development and foreign affairs. Since 2009, in one form or another, Diane has played a critical role in the success of Canada's overseas development assistance programs, including an important oversight role for the Toronto Center. So with that introduction, I'd like to introduce, uh, I'm gonna ask Diane to please come forward and big hand. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Babak. Uh, La ministre uh, qui a dû nous quitter, uh, Mr. Kono, for the uh, opening remarks. Um, I have to say it is very uh, great to see a pack room uh, 
standing room. There is a chair there if somebody wants to sit. No, please, please. please occupy chairs. Yeah. Um, to talk about financial inclusion and gender equality. Uh, th this is really great. This is not something that we see often, I have to say, at the bank meetings. And I think the Toronto Centre, you know, when we talk about the importance of uh, inclusion of women, uh, has done a great job on the panel of making sure they included a lot of uh, women. So, uh, <laughs> but Martin, we're really here, glad that you're here with us. Otherwise, we wouldn't have some, some gender diversity. Um, the speakers have talked to us about the importance of, uh, of, uh, of a financial inclusion and how FinTech can really promote inclusion. They've also outlined some of the risks that we face. So what, our, what we're going to ask our panelists today is really to tackle this complex, uh, um, complex balancing act. Um, I, ha I will ask them question, but I would ask all panel members, please don't hesitate if you want to add something to your colleagues. Let's try to make this as informal and as much of a conversation. You know, I do have a long list of questions I can ask you, but I think it would be much more interesting for, for the room if, uh, if you can build on each other. And you, you're allowed to disagree with each other, please. Uh, we'll keep some time, as Babak said, for, uh, for the room to also ask questions. So I'll start the first question to um, Cecilia. And based on your experience in central bank in Europe, um, can you just tell us how you see the development of fintech as it relates to financial inclusion and gender equality? And we'll ask you a question later on about the risk, uh, the regulatory risk. Well, thank you very much, Diane, for a kind introduction. Um, and um, uh, I see fintech as a potential shake-up to the traditional banking system. And, and a, a shake-up to the traditional <laughs> banking system means progress, and progress is always better than stagnation for, for, for gender inequality. Um, as I prepared my notes for this, um, uh, for this uh, meeting, my mind started to drift back to my childhood heroine, Pippi Longstocking. <laughs> and Pippi Longstocking is really part of the Swedish DNA uh, uh, next to uh, Volvo cars and ABBA music. And haven't you read Pippi Longstocking to your children? and to your grandchildren, I, I suggest you do so. Um, she's on our 20 kroner note, actually, which is part of our new currency um, uh, changeover. And then she holds her bank bag of, of money. She's the strongest girl in the world. She's very independent, and she protects her money bag from, from various thieves that come, uh, come across. And as a central banker, I can really sympathize with this case. <laughs> but to be fair, um, Pippa Longstocking's sort of financial setup is a bit old-fashioned, uh, because she holds gold. <laughs> uh, but I'm pretty sure that if her uh, mother and the author, Astrid Lindgren, who's also on our 20 kroner note, had created Pippa Longstocking today, I can see Pippi Longstocking sitting with her mobile phone, smartphone, latest version, having access to a well-diversified portfolio across the world. She would have had a number of uh, apps uh, doing business-to-business -business, uh, transactions, person-to-business uh, -business transactions. And since Pippi Longstocking was not too fond of authorities, I'm pretty certain that she may have also been involved in crowdfunding and, uh, and Bitcoin mining. <laughs> <laughs> but going back to the subject a little bit more, I had, I, this is a nice view of Pippi Longstocking. But going back to the subject, I think technological breakthroughs gives people new opportunities and new choices, and that vet appetites. Uh, and it means that, uh, that since people don't like the weight, I think it means uh, uh, a lot of fostering needs to take place within the financial industry, but also within the public sector authorities. Um, technology feeds transparency, and transparency, ladies and gentlemen, is the greatest boss you can possibly have. It's a very, very tough boss to live in a transparent world. It's sort of distinguished between um, the great and the mediocre, uh, and it, um, it uh, keeps us from doing bad things and it fa facilitates accountability. Um, making savings borrows and borrowing and, and payments uh, um, uh, traceable uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a really threat, very strong threat to the informal, to the black economy. Uh, and that, I think, is a way forward to increase financial inclusion and, and through financial inclusion also gender equality. Um, I said that it was fostering for the financial industry, but it's also fostering for us working on the public side. 
I think we're going to have to think very long and hard on how we sort of live up to our objective of maintaining a safe and efficient payment system when the system moves into a more higher to a more higher technological level. Um, in my home country, Sweden, um, this changeover in technological breakthroughs, uh, tipping points, people changes preferences, means that the usage of the Riksbank product, cash, is going rapidly out of, of fashion. People are very happy using their cards and their phones, doing their daily uh, economy, managing their daily economy. And this forces us to think about our offer. Do we need to upgrade it into a sort of digital version mm -hmm of cash so that people should be able to go in and out of the, um, the commercial banking system as they wish. But let me come back to that a bit later. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll remember that, that uh, we need to shake up the systems if we want it to be more effective and innovative. Um, Jayla, next question to you. Um, we've, we've heard that it's creating new fin FinTech is creating new financial product and services, mobile money. Um, do you actually think that these shifts toward digital financial services are more likely to help or hurt women? And what are some of the challenges in terms of financial supervisors? Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm from Turkey and we didn't have people long stocking <laughs> in Turkey, but it, I thought it was uh, quite inspirational. I, I also find this whole area very inspirational and, um, and especially working at the World Bank where there are a lot of efforts to promote gender, promote women entrepreneurship, it has been really great. And I think one of the key issues is you know, technology is great, like Masa said, and has brings a lot of opportunities, but we also have to be very careful mm -hmm. that we safeguard um, uh, women who are sometimes the most vulnerable um, from possible risks. So I think in terms of the global sp spread of mobile phones, and I'm sure we will hear from uh, Patrick, uh, the governor, uh, on the, the great um, achievements made by uh, Kenya and PESA and several other countries, where you do see that women have, um, have been empowered through the use of financial technology. And that, that's actually quite uh, Im in impressive and it's also encouraging that we could use the new digital financial services to be able to uh, deal with some of the key change challenges that women have to um, deal with, right? These are the barriers to financial inclusion more generally, but they hit women much more. Mm -hmm. And these include issues such as the, the uh, minister mentioned ID and um, access to technology. Women have, uh, girls and women have much less access to technology than men. And there are a lot of um, uh, countries with legislation that uh, prohibit uh, women either due to lack of ID. There are some countries which require the husband's signature in order for women to have any access to collateral and so on. So there are um, many issues that actually, even with technology, will not allow women to have um, the access and and it's uh, unfortunate because we have data and information for example from Kenya that show that um, you know the access to mobile money services increased consumption levels for 200,000 uh, households and lifted them out of property and female households benefited much more than uh, than men and usually the the mothers are uh, are very important in terms of the education of the children, health, and so on and so forth. Similarly, we have some figures, uh, some studies done in um, uh, female garment workers in Bangladesh showing that electronic wage, ma wage payments into their mobile money accounts really empowered them because they were able to keep their money uh, keep their wage payments rather than having to turn them over to, I'm told, the mother-in-law. So it makes them much more resilient to financial shocks and, and also allow them to, to take better care of their families. So what are we doing at the World Bank um, in order to reap some of these opportunities but avoid the, the, the risks? ID4D is a big program for us and we have been very um, fortunate to be able to partner with many and this has 
has become a major game changer. We have been working in many countries, India was uh, mentioned, but many others as well. Movable collateral registries, which is really critical for women to have access to any kind of entrepreneurship. This is a, a key area of work that um, my group works on. Legislative changes, as I mentioned, access to technology, access to financial capability. Again, the minister asked the question, can we use technology to increase mm -hmm. financial capability? And there is a lot of work in um, linking cash trans transfers, um, social transfers to women, linking that with also um, mobile phone and financial capabilities. So really a lot of, um, uh, we have a blockchain lab at the bank, which is again to, um, to see if distributor ledger technology can be used for remittance payments, which are yeah. proportionately more going to women. So very exciting areas of work, some of which will succeed, some of which unfortunately may fail and we'll learn from it and go on. So I do think as members of the development community, we need to monitor what's going on to make sure that um, there is no uh, repeat of the micro, you know, micro loan um, problems, that there is no extra indebtedness, that we don't, mm -hmm. um, we empower, but we don't um, create the, the environment that women either borrow or get themselves into products that they don't fully understand. So really make sure that we um, increase availability of sex disaggregated data to, to monitor and safeguard from any risks. So that's all for now. I'm sure we can discuss some. Thank you very much. And, and I think your, uh, your comments about the importance of monitoring and sex segregated data to make sure that whatever we put in place actually has the effect intended. Um, Martin, uh, you're with the IMF. We've talked a lot about the opportunities uh, up to now. Um, challenges, can you tell us a little bit about the challenges and how we can mitigate those challenges? Well, thank you and thanks for reminding me that I'm actually the, the only man on this panel. <laughs> uh, we did a study with uh, Ratna Sai and colleagues. Uh, we looked at uh, bank uh, male, uh, male women memberships on, on bank boards and supervisor agencies and the ratio on the boards was about 20%, so here the, the switch was flipped. <laughs> uh, but I, we I, we I wanted assume... you to know how we feel normally. <laughs> in, uh... I, I assume I was asked to participate more because uh, I'm with the IMF and I can maybe bring uh, some of the macro stability perspective and indeed that that's why we went from fiscal issues to financial sector issues and then we, we realized that you know to, to properly look at those issues you need to bring in uh, in inclusiveness um, mm -hmm. so so we we've again with, with, with colleagues we did a study where we look at the macro effects of, of, uh, of financial inclusion and we found that there's a there's a sizable potential that the difference between low and high levels of inclusion make a difference of about two, three percentage points of in growth rates of GDP. Yeah. So that's that's massive, that's massive. Um, but I think what's interesting about this panel is that you, you, you're asking about the intersection of financial inclusion, fintech, and gender. And I think those all, all those three topics, uh, when we look at them, we, we the question for us was to ask is, are they microcritical? And I think for each one of them, we, we, are, we, we have concluded that there, there, is, there is some potential and we need to zoom in a bit uh, closer. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think in your Venn diagram, when you look at the intersection of the three, I think that's the interesting question. And I'll get to, uh, there, there are some, so some, there's some lack of data I mean, and, and lack of analysis. Uh, but I'm happy to say, we actually, this is like two, two weeks ago, we, we came up with a new running of the financial access survey. It's on the website for everybody to look at. And, um, it, you know, it's, it's a 10 years project, uh, but now we actually have, for the first time, gender disaggregated data for, for a decent number of countries. So we went from 30 last year now to 90 countries being covered. So that's the, that's the good news. The, the bad news is we still find that most countries are having troubles with collecting this kind of administrative data on men versus women financial access, mm -hmm. and that makes it uh, harder, and it is, it's especially harder for uh, for the uh, the new uh, the, the fintech, so we, we the data we have are really on mobile money users and mobile money agents, and we do find some interesting facts. You know, we, we find that uh, of course in some countries you have a multiple. For example, in Afghanistan, you have six <coughs> times more money money uh, mobile money agents than um, than ATMs or bank branches. Yeah. So again, uh, there's an issue of how strong is the existing banking sector? How how, how good are they in capturing regulators? 
uh, how, yeah. how, how good is the infrastructure, and that influences how, how much penetration you get from, from FinTech. Um, so, so since you ask about the, the question on challenges, um, let, let me maybe focus on one, one part, and that's, that's the issue of regulation and supervision. Uh, and I, I, again, we, here we've done, done a study with, with, uh, with Ratna and colleagues where we looked at um, uh, the financial sector assessment program missions where we go and look in deeply into, into regulation supervision. And then we, we took that information and we see why in some countries we see inclusion and stability going hand in hand. In, um, in some countries uh, there's a, there's a trade-off. And we find that the, the, there's a potential big payoff uh, for high quality versus low quality supervision, meaning uh, you know compliance with standards and principles. Uh, unfortunately, so that's, that's a good. There's a good news. That the somewhat less good news is that uh, it's the countries with the biggest gaps, also the countries where um, the capacity is, is lower. So I think that I mean that creates some space and hope, you know, for institutions like Toronto Center and World Bank IMF, where they can actually help them strengthen. Uh, uh, regulation and supervision. Um, and I think my, my last point on the challenges, and I, I'm happy to elaborate, is I think unfortunately to some extent, and we see it from country to country, uh, there are silos. You know, we tend to think in silos, and, and so you have you have a division in the central bank or in the Ministry of Finance that promotes uh, you know, women financial inclusion, and then you have a completely different work stream that, that works on financial stability. And, you know, in some places, you know, in small countries, uh, maybe uh, there's not a silo issue, but in most, most countries I, I've seen, you have a kind of de bifurcated debate and, and really people don't look at these issues at, at, uh, at a sufficiently high policy level. Yeah. That's, that's um, I think I, that was just a, more of a, a sort of a, a, a caveat or constraint. Uh, there, is, there is hope, uh, there is much promise. Uh, our data also show that um, uh, fintech can help promote financial inclusion for women, but uh, there are also some some constraints. And in in the same same study where we look at uh, bank CEOs, and, and, uh, and it, we we found about two percent of uh, of women are bank CEOs. When you look at the fintech companies, uh, it's about the same, if if not worse. So again, there are some important constraints in uh, in, in, mm -hmm. in the effect, and may, maybe we are overloading. You know, we are we are expecting a bit too much from fintech when we say it's, it's a game changer. I mean, it has, it has uh, quite a bit of potential, but there are some important existing divides that uh, I think we are maybe expecting a bit too much from just from, from fintech to address, you know, for example, the access to smartphone. If you don't have a smartphone, you know, the, the fact that there is, uh, there is an iPhone, uh, iPhone does not necessarily help. Uh, so. It, yeah, there is some evidence that you can, you can actually you can deepen the, the, the existing divides, or if, if there if there is low level of education, again, uh, mm -hmm. the ones that benefit are the ones that already have the education, and again, they, they tend to be more more men in, in some countries. I, I think it's obvious from from uh, our speakers this morning that it, it's all interrelated, right? And it, it's and if you don't if you just try to address one slice of the problem, you'll you'll never achieve it. So we really need to look at it from from the identification that they have to the literacy to uh, the empowerment. Um, we'll move to Mary Ellen with uh, uh, Women's World Banking. Um, your whole organization is, is all about you know, increasing women access to finance. So uh, what do you see are some of the, uh, uh, the greatest opportunities with FinTech to promote uh, women inclusion? Well, thank you so much. It's lovely to see you again, Diane. Thank you to the Toronto Center for including us in this conversation. Um, and and I, I feel like I'm really just sort of piggybacking on so much that was said um, prior by the minister and by, by the uh, other panelists. The, very, very exciting news for the work that we do at Women's World Banking is seeing all these new players that have now come into the, the market. I, I think there was an allusion to, to microfinance and maybe some of the things that didn't work as well there. To, to now be thinking so much more broadly about access to finance for, for women beyond the the, um, the original microfinance. Um, and as many of the other panelists have, and speakers have mentioned, that, that technology can very effectively get at 
some of the biggest obstacles that women have faced to financial inclusion. And we've had a lot of talk about the identification, and I'm not going to re reiterate those. I do think uh, maybe a, a little bit of a double click on the fact that we see great potential um, in the use of technology, digital technology, the, abil the ability to track behavior, to track movements, um, to help women uh, entrepreneurs sort of work around collateral risk. Uh, restraints. They are the or constraints. They are the number one barrier to um, women-owned businesses. And so, as we're starting to see really interesting algorithms designed um, that are linked to um, the rate at which you top up your phone. Do you do you pay your phone only when you have five minutes left and you're you know desperately not hoping that your phone doesn't doesn't die on you, or you know do you do you plan? So there are some real behavioral aspects that we can um, we can glean and very exciting uses for. Um, um, for credit, um, for credit purposes, um, and a number of people have alluded to just having access to the technology. Two hundred million fewer cell phones uh, in the hands of women than men. In so many countries, women are far more likely to share a phone than uh, than a man is, and they are very clear in every conversation we've had, all the re research that's done. They're not going to bank on a shared phone. That that's for mm -hmm. reasons that you all obviously understand. So the the access to, te to technology is is tremendously important. But on the other hand, you can't just assume that a woman is financially included because she's got a bank account and a phone in her hand. Um, and, and I would just point to some really fascinating work that um, we're very honored to have been asked to come in and look at by this, the Mexican government with their iconic uh, conditional cash transfer program, uh, Prospera, which has for 20 years now really had health and education motivations at the heart of it. They made a very um, a very bold decision a few years ago to see if digitized government to person payments, which are overwhelmingly 97% going to women, could those be used as a means, as a vehicle, as an on ramp to financial inclusion? And um, interestingly, they found they didn't really move the needle very much. And even though financial education was included in the conditional part of that conditional cash transfer, it wasn't really getting at issues that were drawbacks for women or were the reason that women weren't engaging. And so, as I say, we were very honored to be brought in to take a look at what some of that uh, those issues were. We found that very few of the women, and these were women who almost to a person had smartphones in their hands. So we're not talking about the flip phone. We're talking about a smartphone with apps and all of those capabilities. They had no idea that those apps linked to a bank account. They were just were, there was just a very, very considerable lack of awareness. They had a real, almost a fear that if they kept the money on the phone, if they saved on the phone, the government would think they didn't need the transfer payment and they would discontinue it. And so what we've been very engaged with, and I think we all in this room are very aware of the limits of financial education, but we've been very engaged in helping the right kinds of financial education getting uh, get, getting to those women. And I think I'll just, just close on, uh, again, another, uh, picking up a, another point, the one area where I would just hope that the fintech industry, the digital financial services industry, does not emulate the banks is on uh, sex de disaggregated data. Only roughly a third of um, mobile money providers, even according to the GSMA, even know the gender of their client. Yeah. And everybody has a tick box of male, female. No one, if they use it, no one compiles that data yeah. in any way. And so the ability, as we've all said, to, to make sure that the, the the right interactions are getting to the right people. That the the way financial education is being um, is is being delivered. You know all of that. You you can't know that if you don't know who it is you're trying to serve. Mm -hmm. that, that's very interesting. And we'll, we'll turn to uh, Lindsay so she has a chance to also share her views. But I'll ask the the panelists to think about you know, what you just said, Marilyn, because you know, if you said that we can assume that women have, uh, uh, that we have financial inclusion when women have access to technology or they have access to a bank account, then if we're trying to measure what works and if we're successful in our intervention, like what are the indicators we should be monitoring to see if we actually are 
moving uh, uh, the needle. So, but, but I'll turn first of all to, uh, to Lindsay. MasterCard Foundation plays a key role also uh, in promoting financial inclusion and education as well. So what are your thoughts about the barriers and opportunities uh, for financial inclusion and gender equality? Thank you so much and uh, thank you very much for inviting uh, us to the panel. Um, you know, again, I don't really want to repeat what others have said. I think uh, we've hit most of the key barriers that we've been seeing, certainly literacy um, as well as financial literacy, actually having access to the technology. Um, you know, Mary Ellen touched on that. The ID and documentation is a significant barrier. But I think, you know, we have to be careful not to view the technology as a panacea. I mean, certainly there's a lot of opportunities that it does um, afford. Where we have seen a lot of um, success, particularly for women, is uh, where it builds upon traditional social interactions and networks. Um, and just one thing that hasn't come up is the opportunity that technology does afford women in terms of another income stream. So we have a fantastic partnership with the International Finance Corporation and we're working with uh, Finca in the DRC. And what we found there is that women agents outperform the male agents significantly. They do much better. And, it, and for them, it's a, it's a real addition to, you know, it's usually the corner stores and so on. And, and it's a real addition to them. So it's, but in the research on that, it really comes down to the trust. And, and you know, the, the clients trusting, you know, this person who they've worked with or, or you know, buy their, their goods from on a, on a regular basis. Because just to build on what, what Mary Allen said as well, the, we're a little bit in a, it, if everyone moves to keeping the money on the wallet and leveraging the opportunities that the wallet, the digital wallet affords so that you can pay your school fees, that has much greater, will have much greater impact. But for most places, particularly in, in sub-Saharan Africa where, where we focus our work, it's still a cash in, cash out world. Yeah. And I, I'm, expect that it'll be so for some time until we get over some of the trust barriers. So. Thank you very much. Does anybody want to answer in terms of um, how do we monitor? Like, what do we? What is really key to make sure that we can track this? And and the comments are also about. No, you were saying that the um, um, that the mobile phone companies don't even track some of that information. So, what would make like if, if all of us, you know, committed to doing something and trying to put some pressure, like what it is that would make a difference so we can actually know whether uh, there are more financial inclusion for, uh, for women and more economic empowerment. One thing, so we have the um, FINDEX um, uh, information, which is now also sex disaggregated. That will bring some some more, um, at least uh, understand a little bit more how what type of services are used by different um, groups and so on. But I think what I find fascinating is the interaction between what you mentioned, behavioral side of things, and how to how to make sure that we can pilot certain um, initiatives to make sure that it actually goes to women. So there is one project that we have been working together with our IFC colleagues as well, and Bcash is in Bangladesh where um, they do get the um, education, the, the women get education benefits for their children through the digital means. Mm -hmm. And it's now we are trying to link it to providing healthcare services so they can understand and invest some of that in healthcare for themselves because most of them are not really insured. Um, it's slow because it also requires a lot of um, uh, education, building financial capacity. But what is cr crucial is, I think, what Mary Ellen said. They all are scared. But if I buy insurance, will I? Will they discontinue? Mm. So the government is now thinking about a program to provide some subsidy element and also encourage um, women to, and, and children to take um, health insurance. But it is a long way to go. And, and I do think that data information is critical to measure and understand. But I do think we also need to have some more uh, research in uh, or analytical work on behavioral side yeah. of it, how to build trust, how to make sure that the, the products are tailored such that um, female uh, participants can actually use them. Thank you very much. Anybody else want to add something? Martin? So on the, on the data side, um, I admit I'm a bit of a data geek. Uh, and I, I think this is, so <laughs> it, 
took about 10 years to build up the financial access survey. I think it's a great source of information from the administrative side, but uh, it's always a bit frustrating because so many countries have these national financial inclusion strategies and they have goals on including women, but the way they measure the progress, it's really through surveys. It's, you know, it's, it's usually mm -hmm. the FINDEX or some other survey with a small sample of people. So it, it's, it's a big missed opportunity and oftentimes we see kind of pointing of fingers that the institutions would say, well, the central bank is not telling us how to report the data, and the mm. central bank would say, well, you know, we don't want to overload them with data requests. And I think, so, so again, I think this is a, this is a, I see it as a joint effort because it's, you know, the database sits in the IMF, but in the end it depends on what the, uh, what the authorities are responding. So I, I think it's a, it's our joint responsibility. And, I, you know, again, it's a, it's a part of, of our job that, you know, when we go to countries, we, we try to, to impress on them the importance. Uh, I'm happy to say, again, the coverage has gone up uh, from, from 30 to 90 countries, but it's still only 25% of those are actually able to provide nationwide dis mm. gender disability data. So we know that for those countries, about 40% of accounts are women. It's much harder if you, if you go into mobile. Yeah. Uh, it, it, and, and forget if, if you think about FinTech more broadly, I think that, <laughs> so that, that was my second point. On fintech more broadly, I think we have again this issue of, for a long time, uh, things are too small to care. So you know mm -hmm. we, we don't really know, and then they become too big. To, too big to. to, to, <laughs> to <laughs> and, 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 the, and, and the period between then, it's not that that long. Uh, so so and I think that's uh, we. I'm, I'm somewhat worried that we don't have a good grasp on, on sort of and good data on, on the other part of fintech. You know beyond just you know mobile access. You know so when we talk into talk about uh, you know the distributed ledger technologies and, and and virtual currencies you know it's, it's an inc increasingly topic of interest for countries like sweden and and, mm -hmm. and the netherlands and, and and singapore and others but we we don't the data we have is largely anecdotal so i think we we should really start thinking about how we improve our, our data gathering mm -hmm. let me okay. stop here on data thank you uh cecilia maybe I'll, I'll go back to you in terms of the role of uh, central bank and regulators Yes, thank you. Um, so I, I said uh, before that given that technology opens up, uh, I, I, I definitely agree that it's not a solution to everything, but, but it opens up uh, uh, a number of choices uh, and that vets the appetite. So we have to think long and hard on how we sort of make it a good trans transition from a more sort of analog world, more cash-based world to, to a more digital one. Um, the Riksbank Bank turns uh, 350 years next year, and uh, we have a sort of informal uh, motto in the uh, in the bank that you have to you have to you have to make transitions from time to time to stick around for that long. Mm -hmm. um, and if we start with payments, and then we're going to say a little bit about that. It's, it's a tremendous breakthrough to have access to safe and efficient payment methods, and, and as a from a gender perspective. Um, the physical uh, safety is, uh, is a key issue for, for women and not having to walk around mm. with your salary um, yeah. in cash with the risk of getting robbed uh, is a great achievement if mm -hmm. you can have it. You have your money in a medium of your choice. Um, so uh, Sweden is going cashless, uh, not rapidly, but we're going in that direction. Um, and uh, it's not a conscious decision, this is happening, um, but, but kind of looking back, um, we can see a number of factors explaining why, why this is happening. So if you want to get electronic and embrace fintech, um, I can give you a little bit of a roadmap here. Uh, so first of all, um, this is very, I mean, you already know this, but high level of PC and smartphone usage is being provided or being supported by if everyone has reliable access to get through a net, to get, get onto the internet through, 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 through 3Gs or 4G levels. Uh, another important ingredient is, is that banks um, need to cooperate on infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So going back through Swedish banking history is kind of interesting. They have taken... Um, the, the big banks have taken uh, steps to, to, to join forces on infrastructure uh, many times. And the latest initiative uh, was the real-time person-to-person uh, uh, -person payment app called Swish. Uh, so in your mobile phone and half of the Swedes are now connected to, to the Swish system, they can do person-to-person -person transactions 24-7 yeah. across banks. Um, but it doesn't work. Uh, unless the central bank facility is there to, to do the settlement between the banks 24-7, which takes me to the third point, that as a public sector you have to be able to 
to walk the talk when it comes to facilitate innovation. Mm -hmm. Not only talk about it, it's nice to have innovation, but actually, but actually um, prepare to, to think about how, how to facilitate this. It's also about uh, facilitating standards, because standards of different kind is a recipe against uh, fragmentation. And be mindful of high entry barriers and high network effects uh, when you design systems. And, and, and my last message is that carrots are always better than sticks. Um, and um, instead of forcing people out of, of, of particular behaviors, it's always much better to, to offer them choices. Electronic, attractive electronic choices will move people's preferences. Mm. Um, uh, in, in, in our situation, uh, the people's preferences away from cash has been because there are other very competitive solutions. Uh, and then you get the whole fantastic world of transparency, the hard boss I was talking about, uh, and, and easy, easy measures to, or easy, easy, it make, becomes easier to, to add on uh, uh, the various services that um, the fintech or the old banks can, can provide to society. Thank you very much. That's uh, very helpful. Um, you know, and when you say that we need to walk the talk, we financial innovation, maybe I'll turn to Lindsay, who uh, uh, actually MasterCard Foundation has been doing a lot of innovation in this field. So maybe you can share with us uh, a few ideas to walk the talk. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Thank you. Um, you know, I think for us uh, as an organization that focuses on sub-Saharan Africa, one of the biggest uh, areas that we're really uh, watching is the smartphone penetration. And, you know, so much of the, the fintech and uh, revolution to date has really been built on uh, feature phones. Um, but really the the ability to do things through smartphones and to interact both from a financial literacy point of view, um, from knowing your customers, being able to build out that, that digital footprint, I think that's, um, that's really a big game changer. The other thing that we're seeing, and we haven't really touched on it too much here, is really thinking about who are the key players in this, aside of course from the, the public sector and the regulators. Where we see a lot of fintech innovations is in partnerships between um, specialized fintech organizations, but they really need to work closely with both MNOs as well as fi traditional financial service providers. Um, building on what Mary Ellen said, that, that digital history, that digital footprint, and the ability to leverage that to do things like intermediate loans, credit mm -hmm. scoring, um, certainly as well the pay-as-you-go technology for solar power, but also we're seeing that for a lot of uh, water services and other things, you know, um, digital finance plus. Um, but one other thing that I, I wanted to touch on here and, you know, reflective of our, our, our panel is the importance of female leadership in the fintech space. Um, you know, we did a survey in Ghana and we found that only 20% um, of the new fintech organizations are led by women. And, uh, you know, I think one could say that having female leadership here at the IMF has really helped to elevate the whole discussion of, of gender and gender equality. And I think the same probably holds, well, I know the same holds true for fintech and particularly um, fintech in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. There are a few uh, partners that we're working with that are, are fintech organizations being uh, led by, by women and actually young women that I just want to call out. We work with an organization called Farm Drive and they do alternative credit scoring for smallholder farmers and they're started by, by two young women. Um, as well, First Access, which I think many of you may be familiar with, they really build algorithms that take that digital footprint and help uh, more traditional financial service providers uh, intermediate loans, also started by a woman. And uh, some other, um, we have a few other partners, but I think if we're able to allow or encourage more young women to get into development, app development, financial mm -hmm. inclusion work generally, I think the whole conversation, it, it will help to change the, uh, the conversation as well. Thank you. Um, given the time, maybe I'll open the floor if there are some people in the room that want to ask questions of our panelists. Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask Martin on the question of uh, the connection between uh, fintech and financial stability. Do you know of any work that's been done on asset quality between fintech lenders who uh, determine credit basically on data analysis and lenders that do credit underwriting under more traditional methods? Yeah, I don't know if the 
I, I, I would invite others to, to help <laughs> with maybe more micro evidence. Uh, when we look at the micro data, I mean, we find that overall there is a, there is a trade-off between uh, financial inclusion and financial stability. And then, but, but then there are other factors that, uh, that sort of help to mitigate the trade-off, and you can actually see that the inclusion and stability can go hand in hand. Um, yeah, that there's, there's sort of micro, micro evidence on, on default rates. Again, um, th there's no study recently from the Federal Reserve here in the U.S. on, on penetration of, of fintechs versus bank branches. So they found that the fin fintech tends to go into areas where banks have been closing branches. So you have areas wh where bank branches went down by 10 percent between 2007 2016. They, they, they saw a 10 times increase. And I think it's too early to say, uh, you know, I mean, in I think as a, as a broad brush, I think it's, you see bigger default rates, but also it's because you tend to go after borrowers that have been uh, have been excluded by banks. So I think it's you know it's you know the causality is not it's not an easy one to do. Again, uh, when we're looking at our cross cross country you know panel data, we find that in general there is a trade off between inclusion and stability, but there are there are things that that, that tend to mitigate. One is if in general, if there is greater level of secondary education, you know, higher education in the country, you're more likely to see inclusion and stability hand in hand. Um, when uh, when you have deeper penetration of uh, credit information sharing systems like credit bureaus, credit registries, again, you're more likely to see in, in a particular country these two things go in ha hand in hand. And you know, we look at different me there are also different measures of stability and different me measures of inclusion, not just NPR ratios. Um, so, so those those two are, are some of the factors. I mean, that, then there are other things like openness of the economy. Like when, it, when you're more open, you're more likely to see trade-offs. When you see lower quality of regulation, again, you're more likely to see a trade-off between the two. But it's, yeah, it's, it's far from far from straight straightforward. Uh, it's it's also I think that you, when you talk about the benefits of fintech, I think it's these data I'm describing. It's really on the mobile mo mobile based, based learning. When you when you talk about some of these more far out, you know, distributed le leisure technologies, I think the the short answer is we don't really have like solid, robust evidence. We we had a paper that we put out in in summer, um, staff discussion note 1704, where we looked at the evidence, and and the bottom line was, it's not uh, you know the, the current risks are more in the area of financial integrity, consumer protection. You know, there are some sort of broader issues that relate to you know, potentially financial stability, monetary policy conduct. But it's, it's not something that you know we would have evidence right now that you know fintech has become um, sort of a, a present threat in, in financial, like looking across our membership. You now in some countries, you know, to some extent, but not not as a sort of broad issue. So I think we are like in the experimentation experimentation stage. You know, there are different innovations that are being tried out, but but you know we have not really gone through a full cycle, and we can say this is what you know what what causes uh, defaults in, in fintech. Okay. Yes. Yes, um, I'm Bert Kurovsky. When we hear about inclusion, gender, sustainable development goals, all those topics put together to banking, I always start thinking, why don't we have purpose-based capital requirements for banks? Why, why this risk-weighted that serves absolutely no purpose at all? Uh, and, and besides being wrong, because what's 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 really risky is what's considered safe. Uh, so, so uh, uh, shouldn't there be some type of? I can see gender. If we want gender, well, allow banks to have slightly less capital against loans to women. Then they will earn higher risk-adjusted returns on on their equity on women. There you have immediate immediate reaction. Well, the banks are abandoning the small businesses, all that area. Why? Because the capital requirements are higher to when they lend to the risky. So why don't you think of a purpose-based capital requirements for banks and you can move it in the area you want to move? Thank you. Maybe I can take, can we take just a few more questions just to, to make sure then that we'll have the panel, we'll give the panel some time if there's other people that want to ask a question. Yes, we do. Hi, um, uh, just a little provoking maybe, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, uh, I thought, uh, looking at the title, that we were going to have a sort of like a measure of what we 
wanted to understand by gender equality. So I, I understood everything about how we could uh, have a do in order to, for women to access more, you know, financial um, instruments and uh, have them, you know, uh, be able to make the same transactions as men do. But then, wh what do you mean actually by gender equality? Are they going to access the same type of jobs? Or are they going to access what? Uh, are we going to improve uh, income inequality or what? What's the ultimate? Uh, measure of gender equality that you're looking at. Okay, thank you. Maybe a last question, yeah. Thank you, my name is Nana Fajinu. Um, I'm from the West Africa Civil Society Institute. My question is about um, the unbanked women. So um, we, are not, we are not even looking at the banks. Do you have any success stories? For example, using village and savings loans where you've been able to see FinTech actually enable women's empowerment in gender equality. It would be interesting to hear if there are any success stories. Okay. Thanks. So maybe I'll turn Paris. Uh, I see Lindsay at the end. That Go ahead. You sure. have a chance to answer. I'll, ask, I'll, I'll answer the last one. And um, just to say we, we are starting to see more and more innovations between fintech players and the more traditional savings and, and loans groups and i actually have a, a project in uh, tanzania and ghana where we're trying to facilitate linkages between the the vslas and more traditional financial services and the only way to really do that on a you know more cost effective basis is through through mobile technology and there have been a few uh, innovations whereby instead of the in a traditional vsla there's three different keys for the lock box that has been digitized i think digitized i think uh, it was masoni in kenya did that as well so we're starting to see the interplay and again it goes back to the vslas provide that traditional safe trusted secure but there are a lot of challenges with it it's it's you know that we've had a cash box that boxes that get stolen um the loan size isn't very big it's all kind of inward so it's not really doing any type of major financial intermediation so i think there's a lot of opportunity though to leverage technology to to build upon the the good benefits of the the vslas and then help link them to the wider economy So um, I, I think uh, that's a great question. In terms of the um, unbanked, um, we have this UFA 2020 goal to the, you know, address this issue of 2 billion unbanked all over the world. And in this context, I think um, there has been a lot of progress. It's also together with the private sector, of course, with the MasterCon Foundation and others. Um, and there has been progress. But I think at the end of the day, what is really required is what was said uh, by several is the cultural and other issues which are more the deterrents rather than you know sending money through the the prosperas or most of familia or whatever these other uh, systems providing access to finance but rather having financial services rather than just a dormant account or a dormant payment so to to me that's the next step everyone has a quote unquote will have an account probably or some sort of mobile payment but whether we get real financial access and inclusion is another question on um, just quickly on two other questions on gender equality it's a very good question and i think um, here we have the we it was mentioned by the minister as well this is a great facility to bring um, female entrepreneurship and uh, an opportunity to thrive you know it's not of course it's not going to be enough but we need more of these programs because we will only get equality if we get women working seriously i mean otherwise uh, there is this uh, really great study published by the bank about, uh, I think it's called Children Brides or something, which shows the economic impact of um, 13, 14-year-olds who get married and then the implications of that. 
On uh, purpose-based, I really cringed when you said it. <laughs> I do hope we don't go there. Priority lending to whoever, be it farmers or women or whoever, is not a good idea. Banks are um, responsible institutions. Financial stability was raised earlier. And I think to the extent that uh, they are less risky and there are ways, hopefully, to find out about that, great. But otherwise, I would be very worried if we start saying lower risk rates for women. Or, or someone like that. And, and I think I'll stop there. Okay. Sylvia? Well, um, so what do we mean by gender equality? Well, for me, it's very clear that it's about giving same, having same chances in life, that gender should not be an obstacle uh, in the same way that religion or, or where you come from should not be an obstacle. Everyone should have the same chance. On the, um, the purpose-based credits, I, I um, instead of re having risk-based based credits, um, um, uh, uh, interesting notion, but I, I think we, we may end up in a, in a place that we, we don't want to be. And, but it opens up another issue we've been, been touched upon on this panel, and, which was the need for, for gender-distinguished data that you can see um, how women behave on versus men. And then I think your problem will be solved, mister, because uh, it's very clear that women on average takes lower risk and cause lower credit uh, uh, losses to the banks. So then, then think in the same way as women drivers on average are better mm -hmm. drivers yeah. than, uh, no, sorry. No, they are less involved in traffic accidents. I'm not, I shouldn't say that they're better drivers. That can cause a very long debate. But they're less involved in, in accidents. So they, they, in some countries, deserve a lower premium. So you, you may get your will in the end. Not the PP, I remember. She took risks. Uh, <laughs> Mary Ellen, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to add on that the gender gender equality issue, and and great that this risk issue um, has come up because I I, <clears throat> I think it really speaks to what do we mean when we say, say financial inclusion? That having that bank account is is certainly not sufficient. Having a, only access to credit is is not sufficient. There's a very impressive set of, of research that now shows that women, to a much greater extent than men, need to know that that safety net is in place, that they have a safe place to save a certain cushion, perhaps, perhaps some insurance on top of that, but at least that savings account. And then and only then, they will take the risk to grow their business, they'll borrow larger. So it's not it's not risk aversion the way we're saying, oh, women are risk averse. It's, it's risk aversion until they reach a certain point of protection. The fascinating thing that some of this research most um, most fascinating, I guess, uh, in uh, in Bangladesh, was when women had those two things in place, their political participation also dramatically shifted. And so I, I think you're, you're abs thank you so much for asking the gender equality question. But and and I am guilty of perhaps every problem looking like a nail because I have financial inclusion as a hammer. But I, I I do think that there it is the root to so many other aspects of equality if it's genuine inclusion. Okay. Last question to John. <clears throat> um, Deanne, thanks very much. Uh, one of the issues we haven't talked <clears throat> about uh, today is intermediation. And one of the really important ways of lifting um, developing economies to develop status is by increasing the amount of interme intermediation in the economy. The mobile wallet, the mobile wallets, which are really important, um, and, and represent an important sort of short-term, medium-term goal, increasing the, the, um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, the ability of women to save and, and spend through mobile wallets, don't do a lot for intermediation. They don't undermine it because basically <clears throat> they're increasing savings and they're taking what might have been in cash uh, and putting it into mobile wallets. But ultimately, uh, we need to think longer-term about increasing um, uh, the the uh, real bank accounts uh, for women and others in developing countries and getting it back into the financial system. Longer term goal, and what I say doesn't take away from anything we've been talking about here uh, today, which is terribly important and, um, and worth focusing our energies on. Just a longer term thought. Thank you. Anybody wants to uh, comment on that? 
Um, there are there are some studies which do show that the P2P lending is actually very useful for women, and part of it is again behavioral. Probably women are excluded; they, they have a harder time getting credit. It could be demand or supply side, but I do think that we could even get intermediation through um, digital services. So it doesn't have to be banks. Um, before I turn um, the mic over to uh, Babak to introduce the uh, closing speaker, um, I, I think you'll all agree that we have uh, learned a lot today. Um, we have learned that we need to shake the system, we need to walk the innovation talk, there's nothing, we need to be careful, it's not too small to care or too big to handle, but most of all we've learned that we have some incredible people at this table that are very knowledgeable and very passionate about promoting uh, financial inclusion and greater gender equality, and thank you so much for sharing your thought with us. Please join me in thanking them. And a big hand for uh, Deanne for fabulous moderating. You know, as we were organizing this event, uh, John remembers uh, I got chastised by a, a, a good friend of Toronto Center, former uh, governor of a central bank in, in Asia, for why are we holding these events here in Washington? Why are you not bringing them to South Asia or elsewhere that you know we really need them? And uh, she did, didn't necessarily buy my answer that you know we're bringing the whole we're coming here and the whole world is under one roof. So see the caliber of this panel, I can see that. So you know we may have to take you on a traveling tour. So I just want to make sure that you don't go scot free. At this point, I'd like to, uh, in addition to thanking the panel, uh, I'm not, I don't have any more closing remarks. I'm going to leave it for the, our, our special speaker, last but not least. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my friend, the esteemable governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, Dr. Patrick Njoroge who was appointed governor on June 19, 2015. He holds a doctorate uh, in economics from Yale University and has been called Africa's best central bank governor. So that's no minor feat. And he's also noted, he, he will never admit that, but I will say it, he's noted for his efforts to root out corruption and is really an incredible uh, force for stability in the, in the region. Prior to becoming governor, uh, for more than 20 years, he held senior roles here at the IMF, including as key advisor to the managing uh, um, director of the International Monetary Fund. In mid-1980s, he held public sector roles in Kenya, in planning ministry, and was finance ministry economist. And he's really an indefatigable public servant, and we're lucky to have him here today. And as you heard from various speakers, Seems like Kenya in many ways has the answer to a lot of the issues, but I'm sure it's not as rosy as we all think. So let's just hear from the governor. And after that, I just want to thank all of you for coming here today. It was fantastic. We actually use the insights that you provide us. We provide the, uh, uh, the video recording of this on our website to help uh, foster more education and learning for our uh, supervisory and regulatory community. And also the insights that we share, we help roll them out in our various capacity building programs around the world. So a big hand for Pat. Thank you, Babak, for the introduction. And uh, I actually feel a bit like a kid in a, in a candy store, because there's a lot of information that came out from uh, the excellent panel. I have a lot of notes on this, so um, I can share them with you at a cost, but uh, <laughs> that would be okay. And of course, we had a modern minister who obviously, as a leading act, that was phenomenal. So I don't know, I'm the closer and I'm not sure now what, uh, what this will be about. But uh, I just thought that I would just make a few points. Um, not necessarily, uh, there's no way I can, uh, I can summarize what the panel uh, put together or explained to us. Um, but I, I guess related to some of the issues and uh, as we see them from our perspective in the trenches. At the beginning of the year I was, uh, I appeared in a panel somewhere and I made the point that FinTech offers the greatest hope of aligning the world's financial systems with the urgent twin objective of sustainable development and deepening financial inclusion. That was a point we made at the beginning of the year and in effect, we still believe that that is the case. So FinTech 
is key um, in what we are going to be doing over the next uh, five years, over the next one year, and so forth. Of course, this comes um, against the backdrop of a lot of issues, you know, the populism, discontent about inequalities, um, and all these other things. But I think the point I would make is, for those of us that are not yet converted, FinTech is here to stay. And we have to use it, leverage it in all sorts of ways. I think the panel gave excellent examples in the context of uh, uh, gender equality and so forth. So that's the first point I wanted to underscore. The second point is that, uh, yes, we've actually made a lot of progress. And uh, Jayla already mentioned some things about the, uh, the benefits from uh, um, the various money transfer platforms that we have. And it's not just benefits in terms of uh, transfer, it's also economic benefit in terms of uh, the population uh, growth uh, and so forth, people being lifted out of poverty. That is important to acknowledge and accept that uh, some work has been done. Um, I think uh, the best, uh, let's say, explainer of this is actually the MD uh, of the IMF who just a couple of days ago told this story from Kenya and uh, obviously she tells it better than I can. She's a lawyer, I'm an economist. Um, but uh, maybe it goes back to a question about gender equality over there. So actually we were looking at data, we we're looking at uh, various data and we discovered that in one of our platforms uh, about a third of the loans, this is a uh, uh, mobile money trans uh, platform, about a third of the loans, micro loans, are given or they are accessed at three o'clock in the morning. So this is a big uh, I AML CFT issue, right? Instant rate, right? What's going on here? And then we began to dig a little and we discovered actually that's not the case. So looked around and the story is simple. Apparently, around that time, you have uh, a lot of the people that are accessing money, this money, or this platform, are ladies who are street sellers, basically, people in the street corners, and they're selling uh, vegetables or whatever else it is. So at three o'clock in the morning, they're not insomniac, but they get up, um, they actually access the loan, get a loan, micro loan. Uh, they will then buy vegetables at three o'clock in the morning. At that point, the market is thriving. That's when you have the best vegetables, whatever they are. They'll buy that from their home. They haven't, they haven't even left their rooms. Uh, they'll then um, send a message, SMS, to their favorite uh, cut uh, gentleman who moves the cut and with the instructions that the gentleman should deliver the vegetables at the particular location. She'll then wake the kids, feed the kids, send them to school, and then at about six o'clock, when uh, the governor of the central bank is getting up, uh, <laughs> she is now on her way to the intersection. She'll then finish the transaction, I mean, uh, sell in the course of the day, and in the evening, will actually repay the money. So you ask yourself, what, why is she doing all this? Why is she repaying the money and so forth? Actually, what she's also doing is she's building a a credit, a track record of a credit, things that the panel talked about. So this is amazing, the transformation that such a simple thing can provide to women. Secondly, uh, also to the family, you can imagine if she had to be doing, I mean, if she had to go to the, to the market at that time in the morning to do all these transactions, you know, she would never see her kids and so forth. So I'm just saying that these stories are there. And uh, already by looking at the data, you can see that there's some phenomenal uh, progress. But we need to understand the data better. So if there's anything we need to do more, data is one of them, understanding the data. Um, there are also a few other points I'd want to make. There's, a, there's about gender equality. You can talk of it in the context of uh, ownership of mobile phones. This is ownership, not... Uh, Obviously, ownership is one point. We need to go to the other issue of usage and services, which the panel talked about. But the, in the emerging markets, it's something like 14%. That's the gender gap, 14%. Um, 
and uh, countries like Mexico it's six percent Jordan is 21 percent Niger it's 41 percent Kenya is seven percent so we are more or less okay I mean it's okay I mean we are not at 20 or whatever but uh, we are much more uh, closer to the uh, uh, yeah I mean closer to an, a norm which or a target which you would obviously say zero you know you have 50 50 kind of balance but I think the point here which is a simple point is what will happen if we had cheap phones this is a big issue cheap phones and cheap services that to me is a fund is the number one constraint in sort of expanding services and fintech down the road. now I know a lot of us talk of our iPhones right I'm sorry to break this to you. Um, I really prefer the Nokia 3310. <laughs> so, I mean, it's Finnish, but uh, it's so, but it actually, and, and actually not just myself, I'm talking of uh, the people out there because that thing is completely indestructible <laughs> and you do need something that, now, so I'm making the point that there is a whole set of questions uh, about, about supporting the technology, the, um, supporting the services that we are talking about and they're not just about having a smartphone an iPhone or whatever else it is and I think those are things we need to look at um, moving on quickly we were looking at one of our databases it goes back to data one of the databases that I actually mentioned a moment ago and uh, we now again with a pinch of salt here because the numbers are not perfect as we were told it, the customers in, on this large database or this large banking and payments system that we have, uh, it has 41% women and 59% uh, men. However, it's interesting that of the women users, 99% of them are active users. Let's begin there. 99% of them are active users as opposed to 77% for men. So they are much more active. So you're talking about character traits and things like that. Okay, there you have it. So forget gender issues or whatever. I mean, I'm not saying forget them, but you can already see there's something else going on. Okay, but the clincher is women account for 82% of the savings on this platform. 82%. I mean, let that sink. So there's something else going on with women. And it may be something to do with their connection with their families. Maybe it has to do with the, uh, let's say, the expenditure pattern in that family, meaning who is responsible for what. But women are key in this whole process. Now, what will happen if you have a properly a proper designed savings platform? Just think of that. Now, and I'll quickly say that in Kenya, actually, we started on a rather I would say properly designed fintech uh, type uh, savings platform is called Emma Kiber where you can buy for as little as 30 US dollars you can invest in government securities on your mobile phone so I mean today and now if I wanted to buy government securities I'll go to my financial planner and all these other things but what about the fruit seller at the street at the corner of the street I mean if she's earning one, well, $5 a day and uh, saves $1 a day at the end of the month, she'll have 30. She can invest in, uh, in government securities. This is a whole new savings platform and savings opportunity. In effect, it is actually transformational. Transformation for the country, but really through transforming the savings patterns or the savings possibilities of women in this way. Um, there are other points I'd want to make, but uh, I, I would want to just say that even as you see these platforms, the fintech platforms and so forth, or packages or apps, it is important for us to understand where the constraints are for the consumers. And it is important, and the women in this particular case, because it's not just about uh, the package itself. The woman I talked about a moment ago, the we call them Mama Boga, but this is a lady at the street. Really, her biggest, con her biggest risk is getting sick because she doesn't have insurance. So one day, I mean, this is a very tenuous sort of equilibrium, right? It 
reminds me of uh, Fiddler on the Roof, that movie, you know. So you are more or less there, but you may fall off, you know. So the point is, it's important to connect other key services, in this case, uh, insurance or health, and, uh, and it may be just a one-week insurance. We're not talking of uh, a month or any of this, thing. or it may be just one day. That is significant. There's a mention also about other services like the solar energy services and things like that. My point is that the potential is huge if we would only look at it in a systematic way. Um, I want to finish on this, but I, I want to underscore, I mean, to say that uh, there are really many drivers, many factors that drive this gender gap that we mentioned a moment ago. Of course, they include cultural barriers and things like that. But I think FinTech has the possibility of jumping uh, these hurdles. Uh, we talked about the hurdle of uh, uh, um, the Coratro and things like that. Well, with FinTech, um, there are ways, and for instance, you can create your, as we said, your credit history and so forth. But I, I just want to say that uh, we should I definitely leave this room and I go back to Kenya with the idea that we, we haven't done enough. We need to do more. Now I know this is Kenya, right? And everybody seems to say that we are ahead. No, 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 we have a long way to go. I have listened to what you've said. Um, I think there are many things that we need to look at, but I, I really think the challenge is there. I mean, you've really challenged us in this regard. We are doing a strategic plan for the next five years, uh, and uh, in there, a key element will be the, uh, um, the finance, fin connecting fintech and women in particular ways. The other things we're also going to do, climate change or you know, those sort of issues, but I think that it's something that we need to learn from each other. So thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me, and uh, I look forward to connecting with you in another place.